Visualization helped her walk again. The first time Heather O'Brien Walker heard about positive self-talk and visualization was when she saw me in the film The Secret. I was glued to the screen, she told me. When you told the story of how visualization had brought you so much success, Heather was hooked. But how could she create images that were just as powerful, she wondered. She chose to combine the principle of visualization with her experience in Hollywood, where she had worked among many of Hollywood's greatest stars, including Elizabeth Taylor, Tom Cruise, Drew Barrymore, Bruce Willis, Patrick Swayze, and Demi Moore. She knew that people in the film industry are masters at creating compelling images that pull you into another world. In fact, Heather had already seen stunning visual images flicker across the screen and take moviegoers on emotional journeys that literally changed the way they looked at life. She decided to create her own moving images, mind movies, she called them, with positive self-talk in place of the musical score. Over the years, these movies had been very effective in helping Heather overcome obstacles. At the same time, she had also developed a mantra that she repeated during trying times. Don't give up, get up. Ironically, Heather had no idea that her mantra and mind movies would literally become critical to her very survival. In July 2011, as Heather was joyfully planning the details of her upcoming wedding, she also landed an executive position with a luxury retailer overseeing a staff of 30 cosmetics consultants, 50 vendors, and millions of dollars in product. Barely a month into her new job, Heather tripped over a cardboard box filled with trash that someone had carelessly left in a stockroom walkway. As she fell violently forward, Heather struck the front of her head, first on a heavy metal shelf, knocking her unconscious, and then again as she fell face-first onto the concrete floor. Her fiancé, T.W., frantically rushed to the hospital upon being notified, and as Heather awakened in the hospital ICU, she knew something serious had happened to her. The entire room was spinning and lurching like a carnival ride. Her head felt like it was being crushed in a vice, and there was an ear-piercing ring in her head. She could barely see shapes and objects, yet the light in the room was blinding. Thunderous sounds surrounded her, too, as if someone had turned up the volume full blast in her ears. As she struggled to sit up and make sense out of it all, she made a terrifying discovery. She couldn't move her legs. Heather later learned that she had suffered a traumatic brain injury, and that the blows to her head would affect the functioning of her entire body from that day forward. She couldn't feel her legs or even move them without physically picking them up using special straps that felt like lead weights. She couldn't even sit up because the dizziness and disorientation made her feel ill. When she tried to speak, her words came out garbled and slurred. She couldn't recall details or follow a conversation. To make matters worse, her doctors were not encouraging about her recovery. People who had sustained similar trauma, they said, were living out their lives in nursing homes, unable to function outside of bed, and some would just slip into a coma and pass away. It was then that Heather knew the only person responsible for bringing about her recovery would be herself. Immediately, she began building a new mind movie, this time focused on her recovery. The problem was that she was attempting to use her brain to heal herself, when her brain was the very thing that had been so deeply injured. As much of a challenge as it was, however, she knew that visualization would be an essential asset to her recovery. For the next month, Heather worked hard on her therapy and replaying her mind movie. She desperately wanted to go home, but was warned that, most likely, she'd never be completely free of the vast array of symptoms she suffered. Eventually, still unable to walk, care for herself, or do anything on her own, Heather was released to the full-time care of her fiancé. T.W. had to bathe her, dress her, feed her, take her to the bathroom, and manage all her medications and therapy, all while trying to run his business. Then Heather was dealt another devastating blow. One week after being released from the hospital, on the way home from a doctor's appointment, she and T.W. were hit by a reckless and impaired driver, 
causing a second traumatic brain injury as Heather's airbag deployed and sent her head crashing into the passenger window. Considering her existing injuries, Heather was lucky to be alive. And as if that weren't enough adversity to handle, T.W. was also seriously injured, sustaining a broken foot and a severe back injury that would later require several surgeries. The next several weeks were some of the darkest days they had ever faced. Yet Heather continually replayed her mind movie and used her don't-give-up, get-up mantra. One day shortly after the car accident, T.W. approached Heather with an idea. He had an inspiration for a new mind movie, he told her, planning their wedding and officially setting the date. At first, Heather was aghast. In fact, she was angry that T.W. would even suggest such a thing. Wheeling down an aisle in a wheelchair in pain, trying to recite garbled words with the very great possibility that I will lose track of what I'm saying, she exclaimed. No way. Making a complete fool of myself is not what I had in mind for our wedding. As Heather recounted the story, I will never forget T.W. gently taking hold of the armrests of my wheelchair, pulling me close to him and looking me directly in the eye, saying, in his usual joking manner, You are going to be Mrs. Walker, so it's kind of important for you to get up and get yourself walking again quickly. You will walk down that aisle by yourself. Always great at making me laugh, but understanding the seriousness behind the joke, I looked right back into his eyes and said, as if my heart was the one who responded, I said, I believe it. I concentrated many times a day on replaying a new mind movie, that of my barefoot beach wedding, where I saw myself walking down the aisle toward the gently splashing waves, feeling the sand between my toes and the breeze on my face, all as my mantra played in the background, Don't give up, get up. I am proud to say that on April 14, 2012, seven months after sustaining my second brain injury, T.W. and I were married in a beautiful beach ceremony where I did indeed walk down the aisle by myself, just as I had heard and seen in my mind movie thousands of times before. Today, Heather shares her story through keynote speeches, workshops, and coaching sessions with clients from around the world. She's also published her story in a new book called Don't Give Up, Get Up. At the limit of her perseverance, Heather recovered through the power of visualization. What if I don't see anything when I visualize? Some people are what psychologists refer to as eidetic visualizers. When they close their eyes, they see everything in bright, clear, three-dimensional, technicolor images. Most of us, however, are non-eidetic visualizers. That means you don't really see an image as much as you just think it. This is perfectly okay. It still works just as well. Do the visualization exercise of imagining your goals as already complete twice a day, every day, and you will still get the same benefit as those people who claim to actually see the image. Use printed pictures to help you. If you have trouble seeing your goals, use pictures, images, and symbols you collect to keep your conscious and subconscious mind focused on your goals. For example, if one of your goals is to own a new Lexus LS600, you can take your camera down to your local Lexus dealer and ask a salesperson to take a picture of you sitting behind the wheel. If your goal is to visit Paris, find a poster of the Eiffel Tower. Then cut out a picture of yourself and place it at the base of the Eiffel Tower as if it were a photograph taken of you in Paris. Several years ago, I did this with a picture of the Sydney Opera House, and within a year, I was in Sydney, Australia, standing in front of it. If your goal is to be a millionaire, you might want to write yourself a check for $1 million, or create a bank statement that shows your bank account or your stock portfolio with a $1 million balance. Mark Victor Hansen and I created a mock-up of the New York Times bestsellers list with the original Chicken Soup for the Soul in the number one spot. Within 15 months, that dream became a reality. 
Four years later, we made a Guinness World Record for having seven books on the New York Times bestsellers list at the same time. Use Vision Boards Once you have created these images, you can place them, one to a page, in a three-ring binder that you review every day. Or you could make a dream board or treasure map, a collage of all these images on a bulletin board, wall, or a refrigerator door, somewhere where you will see them every day. When NASA was working on putting a man on the moon, they had a huge picture of the moon covering the entire wall, from floor to ceiling, of their main construction area. Everyone was clearly visualizing the goal, and they reached that goal two years ahead of schedule. Vision boards and goal books made their dreams come true. In 1995, John Osaroff created a vision board and put it up on the wall of his home office. Whenever he saw a materialistic thing he wanted or a trip he wanted to take, he'd get a photo of it and glue it to the board. Then he'd see himself already enjoying the object of his desire. In May 2000, having just moved into his new home in Southern California a few weeks earlier, he was sitting in his office one morning when his five-year-old son, Keenan, came in and sat on a couple of boxes that had been in storage for over four years. Keenan asked his father what was in the boxes. When John told him his vision boards were in the boxes, Keenan replied, Your vision what's? John opened one of the boxes to show Keenan a vision board. John smiled as he looked at the first board and saw pictures of a Mercedes sports car, a watch, and some other items, all of which he had acquired by then. But as he pulled out the second board, he began to cry. On that board was a picture of the house he had just bought and was living in. Not a house like it, but the house. The 7,000-square-foot house that sits on six acres of spectacular views, with a 3,000-square-foot guest house and an office complex, a tennis court, and 320 orange trees. That very home was a home he had seen in a picture that he had cut out of Dream Homes magazine four years earlier. The Magic of Visualizing Create a vision of who you want to be, and then live into that picture as if it were already true. Arnold Schwarzenegger, actor, bodybuilder, film producer, and former governor of California. When Kabir Khan was six years old, he found his life's calling the night he saw the world's greatest magician, David Copperfield, perform on television. For days, all he could talk about was the magic show. A few weeks later, his parents bought him a magic kit that had a device in it that made coins vanish. He spent hours in his room practicing. When he turned eleven, his mother bought him a full set of magic equipment, and he started performing at birthday parties and his school. As the years passed, his goals became more ambitious. He longed to train with the best magicians in the world, all of whom were in America. But how could he get there? His family didn't have a lot of money, and they expected him to pursue a normal career. So after high school, he attended college and studied marketing. But he also kept his dream alive by performing regularly at one of the large hotels in Kuala Lumpur. Then for his 20th birthday, he received a copy of The Success Principles. From the very first page, he was hooked. And when he learned that I was coming to speak in Kuala Lumpur, he knew he had to come see me. At the training, he heard me talk about writing down your goals, creating a vision board, using affirmations, and taking 100% responsibility for your life. These were all things he had read about in the success principles, but for some reason, he'd been holding back from putting them into action. Now he dove in. One of the principles I teach is act as if. Act as if you are already where you want to be. This means thinking like, dressing like, acting like, and feeling like the person who has already achieved your goal. So he asked himself, If I were already a world-famous magician, how would I act? What would I wear? Where would I shop? Thinking that David Copperfield would go only to the best stores, he took the train to the high-end mall, where he saw a shop displaying beautiful watches of all types. 
One watch, made by a Swiss company called Fortis, really attracted him. The clerk said it was a watch that the Russian astronauts wore. As soon as he placed it on his wrist, he fell in love with the feel of it. It was so solid and well-made. But it cost $3,000. He didn't have that kind of money. Using his cell phone, he took a picture of the watch, still on his wrist. At home, he printed out the photo and pasted it on his vision board. Remembering my instructions, he made a point to look at the picture of the Fortis on his wrist each day. About six months after my workshop, Kabir found a group willing to pay for him to go to magic school in America. But his joy was short-lived, because after more consideration, the group decided that he was too young. They told him he should finish college and then come back and ask again. He was devastated and humiliated. He told all his friends that he was going to America. Now what would he say? He stayed at home for a few days feeling terrible. Then he read in the paper that I was scheduled to give another talk in Kuala Lumpur the very next day. He immediately went to the hotel where he thought I'd be staying and sat in the lobby for six hours holding his copy of The Success Principles in scanning each new arrival coming through the door. Finally, he saw me come in, walked over to me, held up the book and said, Jack, I need your help. Recognizing him from my last visit, I invited him up to my suite to talk. When he finished telling me his story, I said, You've done well, Kabir, but you need to refine your goals. Don't say, I want to study magic in America. Say, I am studying magic in America. Change your vision board to reflect this. Use images and phrases that create the feeling of already having what you want. I reminded him of principles 17 and 18. Ask, ask, ask. And reject rejection. Remember, there are a million people out there. If you don't get your yes, you just haven't asked the right person yet. After my pep talk, he began asking anyone he could think of to sponsor him. Businessmen, community leaders, even the Prime Minister. He was relentless. And to keep himself accountable, he emailed me regularly with progress reports. Remember the research on the importance of being accountable to another person? See page 86. Not long afterward, a successful Chinese businessman named Mr. Wong offered to pay Kabir's way to America. After meeting with Kabir's family, Mr. Wong handed Kabir a check for 80,000 ringgit, $23,000 U.S., 20,000 ringgit more than the amount he'd put on his vision board. With that money, he was able to go to the United States and attend magic school for a year, graduating with a certificate and an even fiercer desire to become a world-famous magician, the Malaysian David Copperfield. Back in Kuala Lumpur, he began performing regularly throughout Malaysia and eventually all over the Middle East and Asia. He was steadily gaining momentum toward his goal. But to really hit the big time, he knew he'd have to perform in the United States, specifically at the Magic Castle in Hollywood or at a club or hotel in Las Vegas. Now, the Magic Castle is a very prestigious venue for a magician. Only hand-picked magicians are allowed to perform there before its elite audience. His experience with Mr. Wong's check had convinced him of the power of visualizing, so he had a friend make a mock-up of a newspaper article with the headline, Malaysian Magician to Perform in Hollywood. In the article, he included a photo of himself and the news that he'd been invited to perform at the Magic Castle in Hollywood and also in Las Vegas. He put this article on his vision board and read it every day, making a point to experience the same feelings of gratitude and exhilaration he'd have if it were real. It got so that just walking by his vision board would fill his heart with joy. The picture of the Fortis on his wrist was also still pinned to his vision board, and Kabir included it in his daily visualization. He had continued to save money toward purchasing it, and when he finally had the amount he needed, he set off to buy the watch. But when he walked into the shop, his heart stopped. The whole Fortis display was gone. The salesman told him that the watches weren't selling well in Malaysia, so they'd stop stocking them. Seeing his disappointment, the man said, Hold on a sec. Let me just look in back. 
He returned with a pile of watches he said they offered in private shows and dumped them on the counter. There it was, his watch. He picked it up and put it on. The clerk told him that, because it was discontinued, he would give him a big discount. So he paid just $1,000 for his dream watch. Then, after a year of visualizing and doing other practices from the success principles, he received an invitation to perform at the Magic Castle. He also booked a few engagements in some Las Vegas nightclubs. All that was missing now were enough funds to travel to the United States. His fees wouldn't cover all his expenses, even using the money he'd saved on the watch. Determined not to let this opportunity slip away, he racked his brain for ways to raise the money. That's when he had a brilliant idea. He picked up the phone and called the Fortis sales representative for Singapore, who had heard about Kabir's enthusiasm for his Fortis and his persistence in getting it. In fact, he had long considered Kabir an unofficial Fortis ambassador, having inspired a number of people to purchase one. Mr. Michael, Kabir said, it's confirmed. I'm going to be the first Malaysian magician to perform in Hollywood and Las Vegas. This could be a great opportunity for Fortis. Would you like to sponsor my U.S. tour? Mr. Michael contacted the Fortis executives in Switzerland and called them back the next day to tell him they had agreed to sponsor him. He was going to the USA. The trip was fantastic, and performing on stage at the Magic Castle and in Las Vegas was every bit as exciting and fulfilling as he had imagined it would be. But one of the most satisfying moments of all happened before he even left Malaysia. Looking online, he couldn't believe his eyes when he saw an article about his upcoming trip on Yahoo News. He had been reading his made-up headline for months, and there it was. But this time for real. Malaysian magician to perform in Hollywood. He had done it. And quickly, too. He was only 26 years old. The fact that he was the first ever Malaysian magician to be personally invited to perform in Hollywood and Las Vegas, along with his record of 21 straight shows in Hollywood, earned him an honorary award by the Malaysian Book of Records. Kabir continues to perform internationally, and even gave a recent command performance for the Sheikh of Dubai. But there's more. Mr. Wong and he are now business partners and have several exciting and lucrative projects together including the iconic revolving restaurant at the famous Kuala Lumpur Tower, the sixth highest restaurant in the world. When Kabir first learned magic, one of his favorite tricks was to make money disappear. Years later, he credits the success principles for teaching him another kind of magic, the kind that makes money and fame, success, and happiness appear. Today, he tells his audience... Magic is believing anything can happen. Start now. Set aside time each and every day to visualize every one of your goals as already complete. This is one of the most vital things you can do to make your dreams come true. Some psychologists are now claiming that one hour of visualization is worth seven hours of physical effort. That's a tall claim, but it makes an important point. Visualization is one of the strongest tools in your success toolbox. Make sure you use it. You don't need to visualize your future achievements for a whole hour. Just 10 to 15 minutes is plenty. Azim Jamal, a prominent speaker in Canada, recommends what he calls the hour of power. 20 minutes of visualization and meditation, 20 minutes of exercise, and 20 minutes of reading inspirational or informational books. Imagine what would happen to your life if you did this every day. Principle 12. Act as if. Believe and act as if it were impossible to fail. Charles F. Kettering, inventor with over 140 patents and honorary doctorates from nearly 30 universities. One of the great strategies for success is to act as if you already are where you want to be. This means thinking like, talking like, dressing like, acting like, and feeling like the person who has already achieved your goal. Acting as if 
sends powerful commands to your subconscious mind to find creative ways to achieve your goals. It programs the reticular activating system, RAS, in your brain to start noticing anything that will help you succeed. And it sends strong messages to the universe that this end goal is something you really want. Start acting as if. The first time I noticed this phenomenon was at my local bank. There were several tellers working there, and I noticed that one in particular always wore a suit and tie. Unlike the other two male tellers who just wore a shirt and a tie, this young man looked like an executive. A year later, I noticed he had been promoted to his own desk where he was taking loan applications. Two years later, he was a loan officer, and later he became the branch manager. I asked him about this one day, and he replied that he always knew he would be a branch manager. So he studied how the manager dressed and started dressing that way. He studied how the manager treated people and started interacting with people the same way. He started acting as if he were a branch manager long before he ever became one. To fly as fast as thought, to be anywhere there is, you must first begin by knowing that you have already arrived. Richard Bach, author of Jonathan Livingston Siegel Becoming an International Consultant In the late 70s, I met a seminar leader who had just returned from Australia. I decided that I, too, wanted to travel and speak around the globe. I asked myself what I would need to become an international consultant. I called the passport office and asked them to send me an application. I purchased a clock that showed all the international time zones. I had business cards printed with the words International Consultant on them. Finally, I decided that Australia would be the first place I would like to go. So I went to a travel agency and got a huge travel poster featuring the Sydney Opera House, Ayers Rock, and a kangaroo crossing sign. Every morning while I ate my breakfast, I looked at that poster on my refrigerator and imagined being in Australia. Less than a year later, I was invited to conduct seminars in Sydney and Brisbane. As soon as I started acting as if I were an international consultant, the universe responded by treating me like one, the powerful law of attraction at work. The law of attraction simply states that what you think about, you will bring about. The more you create the vibration, the mental and emotional states, of already having something, the faster you attract it to you. This is an immutable law of the universe and critical to accelerating your rate of success. Acting as if in the PGA A great example of the power of acting as if is the story of Fred Couples and Jim Nance, who started out as two kids who loved golf and had very big dreams. Fred's goal was to someday win the Masters Tournament, and Jim's was to someday work for CBS Sports as an announcer. When Fred and Jim were sweetmates in college at the University of Houston, they used to play-act the scene where the winner of the Masters is escorted into Butler Cabin to receive his green jacket and be interviewed by the CBS announcer. Fourteen years later, the scene they had rehearsed many times in Taub Hall at the University of Houston played out in reality as the whole world was watching. Fred Couples won the Masters, and was taken by tournament officials into Butler Cabin, where he was interviewed by none other than CBS Sports announcer Jim Nance. After the cameras stopped rolling, the two embraced each other with tears in their eyes. They always knew it was going to be the Masters that Fred won, and that Jim would be there to cover it for CBS. The amazing power of acting as if with unwavering certainty. The Millionaire Cocktail Party In my Breakthrough to Success seminars, we do a role-playing exercise called The Millionaire Cocktail Party. Everyone stands up and socializes with the other participants as if they were all at an actual cocktail party. However, they must act as if they have already achieved all of their financial goals in life. They act as if they already have everything they want in life, their dream house, their vacation home, their dream car, their dream career, as well as if they have achieved any personal, professional, or philanthropic goals that are important to them. 
Everyone suddenly becomes more animated, alive, enthusiastic, and outgoing. People who seemed shy a few minutes earlier reach out and assertively introduce themselves to others. The energy and volume level of the room soars. People excitedly tell each other about their achievements, invite each other to their vacation homes in Hawaii and the Bahamas, and discuss their recent safaris in Africa and their philanthropic missions to third world countries. After about five minutes, I stop the exercise and ask people to share how they are feeling. People report feeling excited, passionate, positive, supportive, generous, happy, self-confident, and content. I then ask them to look at the fact that their inner feelings, both emotional and physiological, were different, even though in reality their outer circumstances were still the same. They had not actually become millionaires in the real world, but they had begun to feel like millionaires simply by acting as if they were. The Party That Could Change Your Life In 1986, I attended a party that deeply impacted the lives of all of us who attended. It was a come-as-you-will-be in 1991 party held on the Queen Mary in Long Beach, California. Those of us who attended were to envision where we would like to be in 1991, five years into the future. When we arrived, we were to act as if it really were 1991, and our vision had already come true. We were to dress the part, talk the part, and bring any props that demonstrated that our dream had already come true. Books written, awards earned, and large paychecks received. We were to spend the evening bragging about our accomplishments, talking about how happy and fulfilled we were, and discussing what we were going to do next. We were to stay in character the entire night. When we arrived, we were met by twenty college students who had been hired to play the part of adoring fans and paparazzi. Cameras flashed, and fans screamed our names, asking for autographs. I went as a best-selling author, with several reviews of my number one New York Times bestseller to show people. A man who came as a multimillionaire dressed as a beach bum, his vision of retirement, spent the evening handing out real lottery tickets to everyone at the party. A woman brought a mock edition of Time magazine with her face on the cover for winning an international award for making advances in the peace movement. A man who wanted to retire and spend his life as a sculptor showed up in a leather sculptor's apron with a hammer and chisel and safety goggles and pictures of sculptures he had made. A man who wanted to become a successful stock trader spent the entire evening answering his cell phone, talking animatedly and then commanding, Buy 5,000 shares, or sell 10,000 shares. He had actually hired someone to call him every 15 minutes during the party just to carry off his act as if. A woman who was just embarking on a writing career and had yet to sell a book arrived carrying mock-ups of three books she had written. In the spirit of everyone supporting everyone else's dream, people told her that they had seen her on Oprah and the Today Show. That woman was Susan Jeffers, who did go on from that transformational evening to publish 17 successful books, including the internationally acclaimed Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. And the same thing happened to me. I went on to write, compile, and edit more than 200 books, including 11 number one New York Times bestsellers. That party, where we maintained our future personas for over four hours, flooded our subconscious with powerful images of having already achieved our aspirations. These vivid experiences, infused with the positive emotions generated by the events of the evening, strengthened the positive neural pathways in our brains that in some cases forged and in other cases deepened our new self-images of being super successful. And it worked. All those who attended that party have gone on to realize the dreams they acted out that night, and much, much more. Make the commitment to throw a come-as-you'll-be party for your closest circle of friends, your company, your business associates, your graduating class, or your mastermind group. Since this book was first published, Many small companies and large corporations have built a 
come-as-you'll-be party into their in-house trainings, conferences, and sales meetings. Why not build it into yours? Think of the creative energy, awareness, and support it will release. You can use this invitation. Come as you will be in 2020. Join us for a celebration that will stretch your imagination and catapult you into your own future. When? Where? Given by RSVP to Arrive as who you will be five years from now. Dress in your very best. Speak only in the present tense the entire evening, as if it were already 2020. All your goals have been achieved, and all your dreams have already come true. You will be videotaped as you arrive. Bring props to show everyone what you have achieved in the years between, such as best-selling books you've written, magazine covers you've been on, awards you've won, and photographs or scrapbooks of your achievements. Throughout the evening, you will have the opportunity to applaud others in their achievements and to receive congratulations. Sergio Story Sergio Sedas Gerse is a professor of robotics at the Tecnologico de Monterrey in Monterrey, Mexico. While attending my Breakthrough to Success training, he attended his first Come As You'll Be party. Here's his story. In the first two days of the seminar, I set some goals that I wanted to achieve in my life. To be a guest speaker at a TED conference. To write a book on context-based learning, a new educational model I was developing. To take my wife to Greece. To own a house by the lake. To start a tech museum. To develop a national program that would help youngsters develop self-confidence and a sense of purpose. All of these appeared to be distant dreams. I lacked the money, the time, and the experience. And I had even had to cancel my family's last scheduled vacation. Regardless, as I prepared for my come-as-you'll-be party, I wanted to play the game full out. My wife helped me pick out some pictures for a mock photo album that would be my prop to show people my accomplishments. Pictures of the Greek islands, pictures of Rome, a picture of a house by a lake. She even photoshopped my picture on top of a TED conference stage. I was ready. I was a little nervous when I arrived, but I approached a group of people I knew. One of my friends came dressed as an Olympics coach. She shared that she was coaching a league of minors that got into the Olympics. Soon it was my turn. What have you been up to? they asked. Well, I began, I just came back from giving a talk at a TED conference, and I got my book, Context-Based Learning, published. Oh, and I took my family on a vacation. We went to Greece and Rome. And I thanked them for coming to stay with us at our lake house, which I described clearly. A main house with two adjacent houses full of bunk beds, one for girls and one for boys. The party went on for hours, and I shared my accomplishments of the last five years with nearly a hundred people. Eventually it was time to eat, and slowly people began to leave the foyer and cross the line into a ballroom where dinner was waiting for us. I really did not want to go. I felt comfortable in the future, and I was afraid I would go back in time the moment I crossed the line. But it was time to go. Yet when I crossed the line, I was confused. What was real? What was my imagination? I wasn't sure anymore. A year and a half later, I was invited to speak at a TEDx conference in Chennai, India. My topic was Context-Based Learning, Learning Through Understanding. A couple of months later, I submitted a paper on Context-Based Learning and Learning Through Understanding to a conference on Education Innovation and received the Best Paper Award. But that is not all. A friend of mine from Greece invited me to start a non-profit organization called Better Life Day in Mexico. Our first conference was in Athens in June. I needed to go to Athens to see what it was all about. With perfect timing, extra money came my way, so I invited my wife to go with me. Just as I was about to purchase the plane tickets, my wife suggested, Why not go via Rome 
and stop by Santorini, one of the Greek islands. Wow! Everything that I had talked about at the Come As You'll Be party was happening. Three years have passed since then. My national program to generate self-confidence and a sense of purpose in youngsters is now also a reality. It is being taught and migrated into 33 campuses nationwide. I am now an international speaker and trainer. And yes, at the end of each seminar we hold a come-as-you'll-be party. I am always happy to hear the seminar participants play out their dreams and become a witness as their dreams unfold into reality. Milton has opened his own audio recording studio. Gris got her ranch. Miguel started his catering business. It's truly magical. A couple of weeks ago, I picked up the photo album my wife had made for that very first Come As You'll Be party. As I looked through it, one particular picture stood out. It was the picture my wife had composed of me, on stage in front of the TED logo. Side by side, it's the spitting image of an actual picture someone took of me speaking at TEDx in India. Acting as if in the classroom. Tricia Jacobson, a health teacher in Conway, New Hampshire, decided to conduct an experimental two-week success principles curriculum with a group of her eighth graders. For the last day, she planned a come-as-you'll-be party similar to what she had experienced at several of my trainings. Here's what happened. I called it a come-as-you'll-be-as-an-adult party, and encouraged the kids to come all dressed up and ready to act out their ideal adult lives and greet their classmates as if they hadn't seen each other since the eighth grade. On Friday morning, as the party started, a group of kids gathered in the middle of the room, smiling, high-fiving, and hugging each other as if they hadn't seen each other in years, and sharing their stories about their cool jobs, houses, cars, and families. Mariah, one of the popular girls, showed up in high heels and a sparkly outfit with a plastic microphone and announced that she was a popular singer-songwriter and had just come off a promotional tour of her new album. She spoke of her mansion house, her hot new husband, and her sports car. Jeff wore his school baseball jersey and told me he had just been drafted by the New York Yankees. He was still dating his middle school crush and saw marriage in the near future. He talked about his busy travel schedule, his record-breaking batting average, and the new car he was going to buy. Ian was a sportscaster at a local TV station, married with three kids, a dog, and a moderate life in New Hampshire. Justin bought the family farm and was enjoying a simple life with his family. Audrey, who was still Mariah's best friend, was now her personal assistant and traveled with her on tour to take care of all the details and keep her friend organized. Brian was an aeronautical design engineer who worked from his high-tech home office, complete with a wall-to-wall -wall big screen TV, where he spent his spare time playing video games with friends. He had designed an amazing piece of equipment and was on his way to catch a plane to the Kennedy Space Station to witness the launch. The energy in the room was electric except in the corner to my right, where two kids were sitting by themselves. Matt wore a shirt and tie and sat quietly at his desk looking at his binder. Emily was dressed in a navy blue business suit that was a couple of sizes too big for her. She was reading her book in silence. When I walked over to check in with Matt, he explained that he was an accountant. He had a house, a wife, two kids, a dog, and a nice car. He had a couple of good friends, he liked being quiet, and he spent a lot of time working with numbers, which he really enjoyed. Emily was reluctant to share her story with me at first, but then told me that she had borrowed her mom's business suit. She told me that she had a hard time acting as if it was the future, but she knew she wanted to be an attorney, just like her mom. She also told me she wanted to get better at meeting people, because she got teased a lot at school for being so shy. Matt, who was listening to my conversation with Emily, told us that he was also pretty shy and got teased a lot about being a geek. In a moment of divine inspiration, I asked them if they would like me to introduce them to some people who needed their services. 
They looked perplexed, but got up and followed me over to where the crowd had gathered and the others were still acting out their roles. I walked over to where Mariah, the up-and-coming rock star, and Jeff, the baseball star, were standing. Mariah, it's so good to see you again, I said. I heard your album and it was awesome. I'm thinking that you could probably use a good accountant and a good lawyer now that you're so successful. Meet my friends Matt and Emily. He's an accountant, and she's a lawyer. Jeff immediately reached over and shook Matt's hand and said, Dude, can you take a look at my new contract? While Mariah asked Emily about what it was like to be a lawyer. I got goosebumps as I watched what unfolded over the next several minutes. Jeff and Mariah connected Matt and Emily to their classmates and promoted their accounting and legal services to anyone they thought would need them. The bell rang. The students grabbed their binders, thanked me for having such a fun party, and were on their way to their next class. I was in shock. But that was nothing compared to what I witnessed the following Monday. As I walked down the hallway to class, I heard someone call my name. I turned around to see Moriah, Emily, and Audrey coming toward me, arm in arm with big smiles, as if they had been friends forever. As I walked into the classroom, Jeff and Matt were sitting near Matt's desk making plans for Matt to help Jeff with his math homework after school. Although I had experienced the power of the come-as-you'll-be party several times before, I had never anticipated the impact such an activity could have on young people. In literally half an hour, connections were made, perspectives were changed, shyness was overcome, and an appreciation for each other's unique gifts and talents was discovered. The purpose of the Come As You'll Be party is to create an emotionally charged experience of what it'll be like when you have made it, when you have achieved your dreams. When you spend an evening living out the lifestyle you want and deserve, you lay down powerful blueprints in your subconscious mind that will later support you in perceiving opportunities, creating powerful solutions, attracting the right people, and taking the necessary actions to achieve your dreams and goals. Be clear that one party like this is not enough by itself to change your entire future. You will still have to do other things to make it happen. However, it is one more piece in an overall system of powerful, acting as if strategies that will support you in the creation of your desired future. Be, do, and have everything you want, starting now. You can begin right now to act as if you have already achieved any goal you desire, and that outer experience of acting as if will create the inner experience, the millionaire mindset, as it were, that will take you to the actual manifestation of that experience. Once you choose what it is you want to be, do, or have, all you have to do is start acting as if you already are being, doing, or having it. How would you act if you already were a straight-A student, top salesperson, highly paid consultant, rich entrepreneur, world-class athlete, best-selling author, internationally acclaimed artist, sought-after speaker, or celebrated actor or musician? How would you think, talk, act, carry yourself, dress, treat other people, handle money, eat, live, travel, and so forth? Once you have a clear picture of that, start being it. Now. Successful people exude self-confidence, ask for what they want, and say what they don't want. They think anything is possible, take risks, and celebrate their successes. They save a portion of their income and share a portion with others. You can do all of those things now before you ever become rich and successful. These things don't cost money, just intention. And as soon as you start acting as if, you will start drawing to you the very people and things that will help you achieve it in real life. Remember, the proper order of things is to start now and be who you want to be. Then do the actions that go along with being that person, and soon you will find that you easily have everything you want in life, health, wealth, fulfilling relationships, and social impact. Principle 13. 
Take action. Things may come to those who wait, but only the things left by those who hustle. Abraham Lincoln, 16th President of the United States What we think, or what we know, or what we believe is, in the end, of little consequence. The only consequence is what we do. John Ruskin, English author, art critic, and social commentator. The world doesn't pay you for what you know. It pays you for what you do. There's an enduring axiom of success that says, The universe rewards action. Yet as simple and as true as this principle is, it's surprising how many people get bogged down in analyzing, planning, and organizing when what they really need to do is take action. When you take action, you trigger all kinds of things that will inevitably carry you to success. You let those around you know that you are serious in your intention. People wake up and start paying attention. People with similar goals become aligned with you. You begin to learn things from your experience that cannot be learned from listening to others or from reading books. You begin to get feedback about how to do it better, more efficiently, and more quickly. Things that once seemed confusing begin to come clear. Things that once appeared difficult begin to be easier. You begin to attract others who will support and encourage you. All manner of good things begin to flow in your direction once you begin to take action. Talk is cheap. Over the years of teaching and coaching people in my company and in my seminars, I have found that the one thing that seems to separate winners from losers more than anything else is that winners take action. They simply get up and do what has to be done. Once they have developed a plan, they start. They get into motion. Even if they don't start perfectly, they learn from their mistakes, make the necessary corrections, and keep taking action, all the time building momentum, until they finally produce the result they set out to produce, or something even better than they conceived of when they started. To be successful, you have to do what successful people do, and successful people are highly action-oriented. Once you have created a vision, set goals, broken them down into small steps, visualized and affirmed your success, and chosen to believe in yourself and your dreams, it's now time to take action. Enroll in the course. Get the necessary training. Make those sales calls. Call the travel agent. Start writing that book. Start saving for the down payment on your home. Join the health club. Sign up for those piano lessons or write that proposal. Nothing happens until you take action. If your ship doesn't come in, swim out to meet it. Jonathan Winters, Grammy Award-winning comedian, actor, writer, and artist. To demonstrate the power of taking action in my seminars, I hold up a $100 bill and ask, Who wants this $100 bill? Invariably, most of the people in the audience will raise their hands. Some will wave their hands vigorously back and forth. Some will even shout out, I want it, or I'll take it, or give it to me. But I just stand there calmly holding out the bill until they get it. Eventually, someone jumps out of her seat, rushes to the front of the room, and takes the bill from my hand. After that person sits down, now $100 richer for her efforts, I asked the audience, What did this person do that no one else in the room did? She got off her butt and took action. She did what was necessary to get the money. And that is exactly what you must do if you want to succeed in life. You must take action, and in most cases, the sooner the better. I then ask, How many of you thought about getting up and just coming and taking the money, but you stopped yourself? I then asked them to remember what they told themselves that stopped them from getting up. The usual answers are, I didn't want to look like I wanted it or needed it that badly. I wasn't sure if you'd really give it to me. I was too far back in the room. Other people need it more than I do. I didn't want to look greedy. I was afraid I might be doing something wrong, and then people would judge me or laugh at me. I was waiting for further instructions. I then point out that whatever things they said to stop themselves are the same things that they say to stop themselves in the rest of their lives. 
One of the universal truths in life is, how you do anything is how you do everything. If you are cautious here, you are probably cautious everywhere. If you hold yourself back for fear of looking foolish here, you probably hold yourself back for fear of looking foolish elsewhere. You have to identify those patterns and break through them. It's time to stop holding yourself back and just go for the gold.